Hello, 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 hello. Yes, indeed. Oops. Welcome to everybody that has um, shown up. Welcome to all the bodies. Good evening. I am Lena J, Lena Unapologetic. Welcome to the podcast. Over here to my right is Veep, stands for Vice President of Blast Music. Down below, we have D Ray, the producer, um, who is the official musician for everything that you're hearing on Blast. So welcome to the show. <clears throat> How y'all doing, fellas? Oh, it's a beautiful day. I'm here so I don't get fined. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's up? I, hey, that's my girl. What's up, segment? Um, so I'm going to get right to it because we have a lot of things to talk about. Yeah, it's we April, do. And a lot of things are going on. First of all, for this episode, we're going to get on two topics. It is Poetry Appreciation Month. I don't know if you guys knew that it's Poetry Appreciation Month. So we've got a special guest coming up, Miss Jessica Holter. We'll talk about her later and what she's done to the culture. And then secondly, we also have autism acceptance. A lot of people don't know this, but I am the mother of a son on the spectrum. So this is dear to my heart. And speaking right. of dear to um, my heart, we had a loss today that we absolutely must talk about. We must give tribute to. And um, D-Ray, I'm going to let you take it from there because... I, you've got some some really special words to say about this gentleman. Yeah, yeah. This, this today, you know, it's one of those things when when you lose um, an icon, you lose a giant. You know, there's an African proverb that says elderly people are like burning libraries. Well, today a library burnt to the ground. Um, Harry Belafonte has has joined the ancestors. Uh, he was 96 years old. He passed away from congestive heart failure in New York uh, today. And when when you when you think about the life of Harry Belafonte, um, I mean the accolades. We could we could talk an entire hour about all of his accomplishments. You know, just briefly, he's he he's an almost he was almost a knee guy. Um, wow. Uh, th three time Grammy Award winner. Uh, mm. He won an Emmy and he's won a Tony. Uh, Kennedy Center Honors. He's won Humanitarian Awards, the National Medal of Arts, a Governor's Award, and in uh, last year he was inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow. So, wow. De just to name a few. <clears throat> and as far as like, you know, with his music career, I mean, the brother has staying power because all of us at some point or another have heard, you know, Dale, Dale. It was, they are it coming, me want to go home. Absolutely. And that's the banana song. That's one of his signature songs. And that song came out in the 50s. Right. Mm. Wow. So you just imagine how interwoven into the culture that song is and you know, I was saying before uh, we came on, um, even our generation, our generations, uh, you know, for the 70 babies and the 80 babies, our introduction to Harry Belafonte was Uptown Saturday Night with uh, Bill Cosby and Sidney Poitier. Right. And, and um, Harry Belafonte played uh, Geechee Dan Buford in that movie. Um, yeah, I got to jump on that. I have to ask you guys, what was your moment? Because um. I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna jump on that and ask you both, like, what was your favorite Harry Belafonte moment? Because I definitely remember Geechee Dane and Uptown Saturday Night and Leggy Peggy and um, Big Percy and them. But I have another one, so I'm I'm curious what, what where you all stand. Your favorite Harry Belafonte moment? My favorite Her Her uh, Harry Belafonte moment has to be Carmen. Has to be has Absolutely. to be him and Dorothy Dandridge. Um, the the on screen chemistry between them two was just palpable and um you know the dude was talented so before i continue that's my vote yeah I, that's mine too troy i i'll be honest i am limited on the knowledge of him except for what songs he did do and i remember with beetlejuice they totally killed beetlejuice. his song beetlejuice. yes <laughs> indeed <laughs> jump in the line Say your body on time. Okay, I believe you. So, yes, yeah. Um, but I think what I respected more about 
Harry Belafonte more than his artistry was the fact that he stood for something. Um, he helped finance the civil rights movement. He oh. was the one that helped support Dr. King when Dr. King was only making $8,000 a year as a preacher. Um, and I didn't know he was that heavily involved in it. He, he, right. He was the one that paid for babysitters for the King children. He was wow. the one that, you know, raised money for, for Cuban citizens. He raised money for people in Europe. Um, he was a UNICEF ambassador. He, at one point, he was ambassador to the Bahamas, I believe. And he was always critical of, of, of government policies that did not do uh, what he thought was enough to help oppress people and marginalize people. Um, so I, you know, as someone who, who appreciates, um, uh, activism, the fact that this man was able to interweave his artistry along with his platform to promote social change in my book makes him an absolute icon. And to sum it up in 2006 at Duke university, someone asked him what he would want on his epitaph and he said I simply want Harry Belafonte Patriot I love that I love that I, I want to add something really yeah. quick to it before we move on um, I'm going to I can't get it verbatim but I'm going to get the gist of the quote he said I'm not an artist who became an activist um, but I'm an activist who just happened to be an artist and I may have, I don't know if I got it exactly right, but y'all get the gist of it. And I thought, what a wonderful sentiment. I, you know, to say like, and at his core, at his spirit, he was about um, making change in this world. Uh, especially growing in an impoverished area. Right. So peaceful journey to you, Mr. Belafonte. Okay. Thank you for your contribution to our society. And we salute you. Absolutely. Okay. So, Miss Lena, before you go any further, I definitely want you to give your shout outs to your fellowship. Oh, okay. So, um, what, what? I have some good news to, <laughs> to announce tonight. Um, I am here in Charlotte and we have the Arts and Science Council. And after years of applying um, for grants, I got a big one, the ASC Creative Renewal Fellowship. And I am very excited about that. I really am. Um, the, basically, it's this. Um, the monies that are given to us, there were only seven of us chosen. And um, my project was about the evolution of an artist. I'm a cartoonist, but <laughs> this may bother some of my clients. I'm at a point in my career where I just don't want to do anyone else's work. I want to do my work. I've there been caricatures at events since I was 17 years old, drawing in my uncle's restaurant in the lobby, the McDonald's cafeteria. At this point in the game, I want to be an animator and I have been practicing and trying. And so this fellowship comes along. I'll be going to Los Angeles um, for a couple of months studying under not one but two disney artists um shout outs to uh Le'Ron and um this part's even sweeter um executive producer and um screenplay writer calvin brown jr will be teaching me screenwriting so um it's going to be um it, it, I'm, I'm coming at it from both sides learning writing from an emmy award winning writer and learning animation from an Emmy Award winning animator. So that's it. I just want to say that and all this is coming together and God be the glory. Congratulations. For real. Indeed. Congrats. But, but but I got a bone to pick, V. v. You could have kept that picture up just the 30 more seconds while I ate my chicken tender. You ain't have to take that picture down while I was like. <laughs> anyway. Let's... Is it ghetto time already? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, what? That's what on schedule? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> now, you know what I want to talk about. Let's get to the real hot topic. Boy, boy, boy. All right. which, Who which is one? going to take in Don Lemon? Mm. Um, we got, I think, was it the same day? For those not in the know, Don Lemon of CNN, or formerly of CNN, one of my favorite anchors, and Tucker Carlson, 
shown here with um, former President Trump, um, mm -hmm. they were both fired, respectively, from their different networks. Uh, Tucker Carlson from Fox News and Don Lemon from CNN. And as um, if, if you're not, if you don't know, if you're not in the know, everybody's talking about it. Because even if you're not in the politics, you have some opinion about it. Some people feel like <laughs> Don Lemon did some things that weren't cool. And so that's the price you pay. Tucker Carlson, the same thing. Um, I'm just gonna keep it real. A lot of African-Americans feel like um, we love Don, but we feel bad for him. Like, you know, he got his um, his Negro reality check. So hmm. the question I have to you guys is, who is gonna take Donnie? And I feel like he's a foster child. Like we need Oprah or Tyler Perry or somebody to like, to put him back on a news show because he can't just be out there. So okay. I had some ideas. Okay, so first of all, before I answer that question about Don, Tucker Carlson will go down in history as the first white man on Fox News to get a Negro wake up call. <laughs> you wow. know what? This is a day in history. <clears throat> and, and that should be a black history fact because <laughs> anytime that you disseminate false information and you die on that hill and you cost your job $787 million. Wow. I don't care what color you are, you yeah. fired. <laughs> you know what? Matter of fact, matter of fact, we don't even want security to walk you out of the building. You don't even just don't even show up. Matter of fact, don't even show up in the block. We don't want to see you around here. You said they put his stuff like in the lobby and hey, <laughs> hey, hey, like on uh, Mission Impossible, we'll just mail you his clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but getting back to Don, I don't. Listen, he's got time now. <laughs> you never know. Um. <laughs> First of all, I don't feel sorry for neither one of them because both of them are filthy, stinking rich. So they'll be all right. Neither you one of them, ne ne neither one of them, gonna be applying for food stamps next week. Um, Don, on the other hand, I don't know. I feel like Don, Don kind of pushed it with whatever he, whatever he's being accused of by his female coworkers at CNN. But he's been pushing the limits for years now. You know, That's especially right. every, every New Year's Eve. Don is drunk on live TV, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. you go back and look at YouTube and you go back and look at a lot of these other interviews that he's done. You know, he's kind of he's kind of pushed the boundaries he's and been you know slipping and sliding through for years. Yeah, exactly, That's exactly. <laughs> and so well, you you gotta ask yourself who has the pockets to take that kind of risk. I got an mm -hmm. idea. Um I think that if um since he's not with CNN, I think that Don should go with Steve Harvey. I think Steve Harvey should bring him in and put him part of the crew. What, what do y'all think about that? Bring him in. If not him, um, no Steve Harvey. We we got some footage on that. No. Okay. Um, I, I I don't I don't think Steve Harvey has a Don Lemon budget. Um, <laughs> well, hold up. Don Lemon used to weigh in on Tom Joyner the Morning Show. Y'all remember that? Yeah, but how long ago was that? I don't think, um, you know, once you get that CNN money, yeah, I, I, I'm not going back to Steve Harvey, and I'm not certainly not going to BET money. Okay, there's other one. Okay, what about the OWN Network? I say OWN. <laughs> I mean, you know what? For all intents and purposes, I'm going to just say OWN as well. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm running out of ideas. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he could be in like a Tyler Perry movie or something, but we can't just have Don out there. I mean, rich or not, he's too much of a resource and he tells our stories. He checks people um, when they when when they don't come correct. I'm going to miss him for that. Um, I love Anderson Cooper, but he's not Don Lemon. Yeah, I don't know. I think... Um funny uh Chris well, i'm an msnbc girl myself shout outs to joy reed yeah and and that actually could be an option to be and if we're gonna be real for real yeah um, all jokes aside he could go to msnbc yeah um i think don will find a job quicker than tucker i know that i can agree with that yeah um <laughs> so msnbc o oprah oprah has the type of power that she could probably go put him in a sleeper hold if he gets out of control so you just never know um <laughs> But uh, but yeah, shout out to them. Enjoy this extended vacation wherever you may wind up. <laughs> Indeed. 
Well, we got the most there. Of so um, before we bring our guest on, who do we have for our Blast Artist of the Week? Um, who do we have coming up? Because I'm, I'm curious um, who we're going to play. I loved Kelsey's song last week, but I got an idea if it's some, somebody that I'm, I'm, I'm itching to hear. What we, what we got, Beat? Well, it's definitely one who's been a pillar of blast since the beginning of blast, um, rising from the ashes like the Phoenix. It's our boy, Elijah Rosario. And um, it's a banger, so it's, it's definitely going to be worth it. Are we going to drop it now or later? Yeah, let's drop it now because um, I'm anxious to get to our guest and um, I need a little music to get me in the mood. All right. And who's coming? Who do we bring out after the music? I would like to bring in um, Stefan, Colin, Stepney, and Shane. Okay. All right. So again, this is Elijah Rosario, and this song is called Aura. Enjoy. Should've known, baby. Should've known, baby. Should've known, baby. Should've known. Should've known. It's your mind, it's your wave, it's your aura Wanna get to know ya, wanna get to know ya By the way you work those hills, you'll be dressed to kill Wanna get to know ya, wanna get to know It's your mind, it's your wave, it's your aura Wanna get to know ya, wanna get to know by the way you wear those hills, you'll be dressed to kill. Wanna get to know you, wanna get to know. I'm digging your style, I love it when you smile. Any room you walk into, girl, you always shut it down. Got a cold bottle shape, when you walk I see it shake. Wanna take it off this plate, come and take a ride with me. Girl, if you just give me time, I'll impress your mind. If I brought you flowers for no reason, would you mind? Make love just how you want it. Cook breakfast every morning. Before you go to work, we get it popping, got you moaning. It's your mind, it's your wife, it's your aura. Wanna get to know ya, wanna get to know ya. By the way, you work those hills, you'll be dressed to kill. Wanna get to know ya, wanna get to know. It's your mind, it's your wave, it's your aura Wanna get to know you, wanna get to know By the way you wear those hills, you be dressed to kill Wanna get to know you, wanna get to know Can y'all hear me? Yep. Okay, awesome. Um, before we move on um, and we welcome our guests, um, what did you guys think about the song? 
Anybody thoughts on that? <laughs> I love keep it. it. In keeping with Blast tradition, that is another song that needs a child support and indemnity clause because you know somebody could get knocked up behind that one. So uh, okay, that's that a need, smooth it one. Need, it needs it needs to, it needs some kind of disclaimer. So shout yeah. shout out to Rosar to Elijah Rosario for real for real. I loved it. So I want to introduce our guest, who I am very happy to have here today. As I said at the beginning, this is April, and we are doing both um, poetry appreciation as well as autism acceptance. And I have two talented people here joining us. First, we have um, right below me, we have Shane D. So we're going to give her a hand for joining us tonight. Right Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us, Shane. And then um, in our Brady Bunch box over here to my right, we have Stefan Collins Stepney. Thank you for joining us. Thank you both. Thank you. So um, I've got a couple of questions, but I'm going to put you both on the spot, right? Um, if you don't mind. Stefan, I'm going to start with you because um, we start off as Facebook friends and we, we've um, become pretty good friends. And I just want to um, kind of go into our topic tonight, which is labels. And my thing is we all have some form of a label that people want to put on us. If you could give us a sentence with all of your labels, and then I'm going to ask Shane the same thing. What are your labels in terms of what you do, um, who you are at your core, all of that? Tell me that. Um, let's see. A black autistic writer, actor. Uh, how I identify? <laughs> okay, got you, got you. Um, Shane, did, um, did I get yours? Okay, uh, I think we lost Shane for a moment. So when she comes back, oh, there she is. Okay, Shane, can you hear us? Okay, might be a little static on her end. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. So my question to you is your labels. If you could give me a sentence about how you identify. Now, what other people have to say about you, but how you identify, what would be your labels? Okay, so um, this is gonna happen, you know, from time to time. We oh, okay, go ahead. Gender fluid. Gender fluid. That's good. I like that. Um, I'm. Looks like I, you're in the kids' room, or like I, I feel like there's a young person. Uh, woman one of those is mom or man. <laughs> hmm. To, uh can't hear you that well um that um it's a little static you, by the way Corey okay. mcpherson is going to be uh, possibly joining us later and during this conversation and he's kind of coming from my end because we are both parents of children on the um on the spectrum of autism but before we bring um Corey in stefan can you um then you mentioned being an actor so i've got some questions about that yes I understand that you were on the show The Wire for a while, right? No, least, I was on one, one episode, episode, had two lines. <laughs> but you were on it, though. Not for and a that's while. that's what matters. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? And um, then I want to ask you about, like, the work that you're doing. Okay. Well, um, The Wire was interesting. If you have at least one speaking line, then you're considered a principal character. You get your own dressing room and have your own trailer. And I had to cuss a lot to beat a junkie up. That's it. <laughs> so you were like thug number four, huh? Dr no, I was drug slinger number two. Get it oh, right. Drug, <laughs> drug slinger. That's number old two. school right there. Drug number slinger two. number two. And my, and my mother will tell you she was proud because I auditioned, <laughs> for drug, I auditioned for drug slinger number one, who only had one line. But I got drug slinger number two. We had two lines, so I doubled my lines with the audition. <clears throat> Is it just me or does that sound like a rap song? Drug slinger number two. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't know. Um, I'll get back to y'all on that. But, but yeah, I, I went to audition with Justin Lee number one. But then the game with Justin Lee number two, we had more lines. So Cool, cool. <laughs> uh, they making jokes in the green room, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're going to be calling you that from now on. Now, I'm going to put you on the spot before I get to Shane because um, I understand that um, you're a poet. Um, so I definitely want to talk about that because for me, the connection that I have beyond having a child on the spectrum is that when you are creative, like all three of us are, 
you have a different way sometimes of seeing the world. I mean, you know, all my life I've had, you know, people that they liked me, but they kind of always thought I was a little out there, a little weird, you know, and I kind of embraced mine. So my question to both of you, um, both being on the spectrum of autism, what is the thing, number one, that annoys you the most about what um, neurotypicals, which means people who aren't on the spectrum, what annoys you the most about what they don't get? Or what would you like them to know that you feel like is always misunderstood? I'm sure there's a list, but what's like the main thing that gets you? You want to take a shot? Um, okay. The stereotypes. The stereotypes. Ah, got you. Like, say, Rain Man. Who was not autistic, by the way. <laughs> you know, they always um, think that way, though, whenever. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I think we, our audio is a little, a little messed up there, but that's okay. Uh, Ken. Okay. Well, we'll, um, there's some uh, people always, you know, they they have an uh, the stereotype of what it looks like. So some people will say, "Oh, you don't look good, or you don't sound it," and and so there's a saying um, that people may have heard. If you met one person with autism, you met one person. I've definitely oh. heard that. Yeah. And so it was, it's all different. And so people think of a typical or the good doctor as things. But, you know, there are people who don't, who you want to always know because there's such thing called social masking, what a lot of people do. People of color, women, um, LGBTQ people do it more than anybody else because that's a survival technique. Um, yeah, could you, in layman terms, break that down? Because I know about masking and I learned about it. Actually, I learned more about it from you. Um, my son does it, but what really got me was the idea that we all mask not just people on spectrum, but neurodivergence, neurotypicals. In some way, there are things we do to cope when we get stressed out, like grabbing our hair. I grab my dreadlocks sometimes when I'm nervous, or sometimes I kind of I dance around when also, I'm feeling a certain way. Yeah, those are like the other stemming parts. Um, masking is more hiding those things, like maybe ah. hiding your stems, uh, looking, appearing more neurotypical to make other people comfortable. Everybody does mask, but at the same time, it's a higher cost autistic people end yeah. up with health issues and things like that. Yeah, could you expound on that? Shane, what, what do you say on that? Okay. Um, uh, I would agree. Okay. Yeah, there's a little bit of a we delayed reaction. You, you mask to appear more normal. I, I hear that. I hear that. Well, um, so, um, you know, for me as the mother of a son on the spectrum, um, and my son is actually in the other room. I thought about calling him in here to say hello, but he doesn't like to appear on screen. One of the stereotypes that I have noticed is that a lot of people assume that people on the spectrum of autism are, are sensitive to noise. That's not my son. He's actually comforted by noise. He will come home and he'll turn the TV on in my room, his room, the office. Um, it, it comforts him. So, you know, that's one of the ones that I, you know, like to correct. Um, and again, I've definitely heard the one of people thinking he doesn't look like that. Like there's a, there's supposed to be some kind of look. Does it make you angry? Or are you at this point, are you, do you all feel like, uh, it's par for the course. I'm just trying to enlighten people. I can't get mad. I have to exercise patience. Or are there moments where you do get mad and you're like, you know, at this point, um, why is it called autism? Um, I know that was it once it was called autism, not um, autism acceptance, or autism awareness. And it's like, what's to be aware of? People know, don't they? What say you on that? Either one? Oh, so um, there was uh, somebody, 
um, somebody said they want both awareness and acceptance because sometimes even people that know about it, they don't know what exactly it is. So then they have stereotypes about people when they see it. Um, so I can see both. Um, for me, it's just frustrating. Um, and so, because, and also like just, you know, saying autistic, a lot of people don't, autism is a spectrum, but it's a different, it's not linear. It's not low functioning or high functioning gets a circle. It's different things you do with every day and, and the functioning level can change depending on your day and your environment and your stressors. And so um, I want people to know that I had an interview for something, two interviews. They went totally different because my day, my function was different the next day. Um, and so I just want you, want more people to know that. Um, and it's okay to just say autistic sometimes because sometimes people, you know, sometimes people they're scared to just say it <laughs> you know almost uh where like people say african-american i was thinking that yeah because they don't want to say black again back to the labels thing don't want to say gay because you know and i'm just gonna well i'll speak on this a little later on but for me personally i'm i want the open dialogue i understand that the potential to accidentally offend someone because I, I don't know their journey is possible but you know we're, we're, we're gonna keep walking in tiptoes until we have these honest conversations we need to get right. uncomfortable I, I really believe that not disrespectful but uncomfortable and whether that's lgbtqa whether it's dealing with a disability or being of a different race or religious sexual orientation have these conversations that's how we make the changes you know but um that, that's gonna take work. It's easier said than done, right? All right? So um I also wanted to, I'm not quite sure how to how to ask this, but um from both of you, I have a request if I can. Um Stefan, from you, I know that um that you are an actor and um you have a piece that I really like, and I think you know what I'm gonna ask for. You were in a Shakespearean production of Midsummer Night's Dream, which is one of my favorite um, plays by the Bard. And in the production you were in, um, it takes place in Montego Bay or Jamaica in, somewhere. In Jamaica, instead of in, Greece. Okay, instead of Greece. Thank you. And so I would like if you could give the audience a little bit of that. Um, okay. I'm not trying to make it look like show and tell. I'll give it a little I background. Um, there's four lovers. Two men love the same woman, Lysander and Demetrius. Demetrius is loved by Helena, but Helena doesn't want it. So she tells him they went to the woods. He follows him into the woods and Helena follows him. So he's telling her to get away. So I'm going to give you the regular version, then the Jamaican version. Okay. Okay. Um, get us with it. The regular version, uh, he's telling her, you know, he doesn't want her there. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where's Lysander and fair Hermia, the one I'll slay? The other slayeth me. Thou toldest me they were stolen unto this wood, and here am I woke within this wood because I cannot meet me, Hermia. Hence get thee gone to follow me no more. Now, Jamaican version was, I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where's Lysander and fair Hermia, the one I'll slay? The other slayeth me. Now they'll told us to me they'll stolen into this wood and here am I woods within this world because I can't meet me earn me out. Let's get the going to follow me no more, Omar. And so it's the same uh Wait, well you missed the part. That was one word I was waiting on. That one word. Hmm. Bumble clot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that I was want it. to be Bumble Clot, man. Let's get going to follow me no more, Omar. Bumble clot. Nice, nice, nice. So. Thank you, thank you. So um Shane, if you don't mind, I would like to hear at least a, some of your point. I know that um, we're, we're running a little bit out of time, but I would like to, because this is going to be the perfect segue to bring on our next guest, because this is also um, National Poetry Appreciation Month. And I understand you're a very talented poet. I, I read a little bit of something that you sent me, and I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I don't know if our audio Thank will you. allow for it, though. <laughs> Um, see. okay. Um, can you read it? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, you know what? I feel like, believe it or not, that feels disrespectful. Um, I tell you what, because I know that, um, we're, we've got to move on. Can you do me a favor? I'm going to do another event where I'm going to have like all poets 
would you come back and then then we'll have the audio like on your part set up and then you can read it because as much as i wouldn't mind it's almost like drawing someone it feels disrespectful because it, it, it it's from you does that make sense okay that's sounds- yeah yeah, yeah. I understand. Um, sometimes um um, my last guess, I was like, please come back. We can't get into every topic tonight. That's something yeah, I learned. Makes total sense. It's only my second podcast. And I'm noticing we need more time. We need more time. There's so many questions I want to ask. I got eight questions I need to get to because we ran out of time. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say um, thank you both for coming. And if you need, would consider coming back again, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you for and, having uh, me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming, Stefan and Shane. Um, words can't can't express. I appreciate it. I really do. This, this right. has been nice. And next time we can talk about um, your screenplay. I know you can't get into the details now, Stefan. It's kind of hush hush top secret. But you've got some big news brewing too for you, right? Okay. okay. So we'll get into that. And then Shane, I'm hoping that the next time you can um, perform it yourself and along, it will just make it a whole poetry session. All right. Thank you both. Thank you. Right, thank you. All right. Cool. Okay. Santa Stefan. Oh. <laughs> oh, did you want to talk about that? Yeah, just, just, I just put that out there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, oh, um, let's see here. So let me go ahead and tell my admins. I'd like to go ahead and bring in Miss Jessica, um, if um, if she's ready, and um, we're going to go ahead and cue um, her up now. Ah, hey, hey, there you are. Hello. Mwah. Can Can you hear me? Oh, your mic. Your mic. It, it's uh, mic's muted. Hi. Hey, Jessica. How are you? Girl, I'm, mm, okay, I'm having a couple of things going on right now. First of all, welcome to the show. Thank welcome you. Show. I've been on a high all day. You look pretty much the same as you did the last time I saw you. You, uh, know, <laughs> you do not age. Um, so listen, um, before I start asking questions, mm-hmm. let me just say that um, Jessica, you know, just like on this on a cool note, we had this conversation that I asked if she would come to the show yesterday. Because yes. I was like, we cannot let Poetry Appreciation Month go by and not have the head doctor, <laughs> Ghetto Girl Blue, come on the show. And she said yes to me and shouts out to your wife and manager for making all this happen. Mwah, chef's kiss. Because I've been a fan since um, since day one. Uh uh-huh. How you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I'm losing my voice. I've got my water bottle, you know, right here to kind of get me through. I guess you know something about that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Getting through all those shows. <laughs> um, I have so many things to ask you, but let me see. Where do I want to start? Um, I want to ask what projects you're working on, but first I want to ask a very basic question. What was the inspiration for the Panani Poets? Because for those of you all who do not know, Jessica Holter is the creator of the Panani Poets. She is the original digital creator of the Panani Poets. And they are an international group that, uh, it is international, correct? It is. Okay, I, 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 knew, I, <laughs> I follow you on social media. So I've seen all like different countries you've been in. Okay, I knew that answer. But um, international poetry burlesque show, but it's more than just spoken word. I've been yes. to the show live, and you're getting like, um, what? Well, let I, you tell us about it. <laughs> okay, so um, I thought of the Punani poets way back in uh, 1995. I was a hip hop entertainment journalist, and Easy E had just announced. Um, that he had AIDS. I think by the time he announced it, it was already full blown AIDS. At the time I had been concerned because like hip hop had changed, you know, a lot to where um, it just changed the 
image of black women. It changed the conversation around black sexuality. So um, I wanted to create a book. So I started the whole thing to do this book called Punani the Hip Hop Songs that was going to be like hip hop in that it had like the scantily clad bodies and it had rhymes, but it was poetry. Um, and it was a in your face kind of address on black sexuality. And I wanted to do it um, in a way that was very reminiscent of hip hop, but in between, like if anybody has a copy of that original book, uh, they'll see that there are these pages in there that are specific to sexual health. So I wanted to create a conversation around sexual health that was also gave a nod to hip hop, but at the same time, I wanted to kind of deflect the what I what I saw coming. Mm. What what um C Dolores Tucker was talking about at the time. Yes. Right? Yes, ma'am. Which she warned us. Hey. She did. She, she did. did. She tried. And we she were did. all like, right. we were all like, no, we're mature enough to know the difference between fact and fiction. And we should be able to, and now here we are. You know, 30 years later, calling each other, calling ourselves bitches and hoes and getting treated that way. So, yeah. That's an excellent um, point. Thank you for bringing that up about her. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for that explanation. I'm still thinking about, see, I hadn't thought about that name in years. Like, yeah. Me back. I'm like, oh, I'm all, I'm She was about. like, this is going to not go well at all. <laughs> and we were like, Oh, we're we're mature enough. We thought we were. Even as a journalist, I thought I was mature enough. So, you know, I'm going to segue that into, um, since we're talking about the origin of how you got into the whole spoken word thing, and then, of course, Panani Poets. What was the reaction to people when you told them the name? Let's begin with that. Because I'm wondering, did you experience everything from what's a Punani to, oh, that's so vulgar. And actually, I think Punani is a beautiful word. If we're going to refer to the vagina as any other euphemism or term, Punani just, it rolls off the tongue so lovely. Punani. <laughs> now I'm horny. Sorry. No. <laughs> I'm not, yes. <laughs> I think I used to have a, a slogan. What was it? Um, Punani, even the word feels good in your mouth. Um... Yeah, I mean, I guess people were, there was already a song at the time. There was a, a um, like a Jamaican, some a, kind a Jamaican of song. Uh, yeah. yeah, there might have been two. Like, yeah. there might have been two at the time. Like, it was a, it was popular enough where we knew what it meant. Well, now, it, yeah. <laughs> right. We, we knew what it meant. But um, I had met a guy in college who was Jamaican guy I used to hang out with, a friend of mine, and just, Every little word he says sounded so sexy. I just love the Jamaican love the accent, um, accent, and just the whole they energy of it, and the, the pace and the rhythm of it. And at the time, um, up until a couple of years ago, I thought I was part Jamaican. I got my DNA done. Long story. Okay. okay. <laughs> Long story. So I I thought I had some claims to it in a way, um, and I just thought it was such a beautiful word. You know, for 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 pussy, like it was just right. such a beautiful word, like punani. It just sounds yeah, like Jackson says, "Well, damn." <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds so good, you know. It does. Um, that I was very um, upset when I went to to go to the um, the uh, trademark office with it because they used my own description against me. I said Punani was was a Caribbean euphemism for female genitalia. And they said, oh, see, right there, it says online. I'm like, well, I wrote that. And they're like, um, yeah, but because of that, you can't trademark it. So I had to do the Punani Poets, and I did it as a service mark. And later I formed a nonprofit organization, which is the direction I wanted to go in anyway for my theater company. So it was just fine like everything worked out okay but people you know what was interesting wasn't so much what they thought about the word punani because not like i made it up or anything what was interesting was how the 
poetry community, which wasn't very large at the time, but the poetry community gave me such pushback about talking about sexuality in the form of poetry. Are you that's, kidding me? What? Yeah, that's what was hard. I, 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 I'm, I'm genuinely shocked to hear that because given the spoken word places I've been, I went to, uh, there was at least five sensual poets in the house every night. That, that's yeah. Shocking. Yeah. yeah, but most people don't know, like without me, like there wouldn't really be a genre of it. And I took all the bumps and bruises. Shout out to some other people out there like Bo MF Ellis, like will tell you he there was no space for him to do anything. He had to carve his own, you know, space out for it. But prior to the Punani Poets, nah, there really wasn't a market for it. Even Deaf Poetry Jam like never invited me. I'm, I'm completely still- closed out of certain markets. Um, and I really don't know why, because anybody who knows my work, most of my true fans, fans of my poetry, understand me to be more a socio-political poet. Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I've seen your show live and on, you know, um, Real Sex on HBO. So I think for a lot of people, that's where they kind of stop. You know, they, that's where some are, people got introduced to my work, but I was doing poetry before that. So, mm-hmm. um, so Don is moving around down here, and I don't understand why. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know how it is. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just happy my son is behaving tonight. <laughs> right. He's not joining me on camera. So, right. you were like one of the few, um, let me just say this real quick to brag on you, real quick. Um, because as you know, I'm a big fan. My ex-husband and I used to every um, Friday night watch Real Sex. And when we saw the Punani Poets came on and we were in the spoken word at the time, it was like, oh my God. <laughs> wow, wow. We, we just, and then you were asked back a second time. I don't think there was ever a group on HBO's Real Sex that was asked back a second time. Like, right. You know, that blew my mind and we couldn't get enough of it. Um, just you know, watching you and, and um, the other performers, I was like, I, I, I don't know, I wouldn't say I didn't think it was possible, but there was nothing like that at the time, N- nothing like that. It, there was nothing like it. No, there was nothing like it. And, you know, more importantly, um, I wanted to jump in and have a conversation about sexuality that was honest, that was mature, that was open, and that was also from a female perspective. Because at the time, females weren't speaking. Females were bodies. They were the bodies in the video. There wasn't there wasn't um, books yet that females were writing about their experience. They were literally used to promote hip hop, to make the the male entertainers the stars that they became. Okay, and I don't think at the time there wasn't even a a, a female rapper who had gone beyond um, five hundred thousand albums at the time. So. The female voice was definitely buried for the the hip hop community. Um, And a lot of girls, (laughs) I'm not gonna get gossipy, but a lot of girls, I was a journalist. I was a journalist at the time, so I can tell you right now, a lot of girls, even the female journalists were doing things in order just to get interviews, okay? So what I saw as a female journalist was people like giving head just to get backstage at a concert. Wow. Um, yeah, so hip, so Punani was a response to what I saw actually going on in hip hop and what I could see that it was going to be. I mean, I'm a Scorpio, I'm a little clairvoyant, but it wasn't that. It's obvious. It was obvious what direction we were going in with um, the whole entertainment thing. And what I think a lot of people also do not understand is that this kind of money that that black people are making um, from music, this is new. This is within my lifetime. You you understand I'm 53. So within my lifetime, people have gone from just being like basement poets to being multimillionaires in our lifetime. So now you see a lot of, whereas before it was like, we do what we want to do and all this. Now, a lot of those people who started out 20 years ago are now parents or 30 years ago. That's right. Are now parents. So now they're like, oh shit, no, I wouldn't let my kid listen to my music. <laughs> but back then there was none of that. Nobody was speaking out. Right? Right, right. Yeah. And yeah I- so I looked at Punani Poets as a movement. Um, I was willing to do I, I did have some issues with 
whether or not I wanted to do real sex or not because it really wasn't um uh, they only featured three black uh topics three black people three black groups or whatever in the whole time it was us it was um some male strippers and there was a female there was some jamaicans that the like jamaican a, 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 a dance thing yes right because i told you i was a fan <laughs> i was like it's like right like you said two or three that's it it was two or three and we were one of them and um so the black sexuality the voice of black sexuality just wasn't there at all so you know it's despite uh the pushback i'm good i'm I'm glad that i decided to use the venue um to push my message and uh davy d will tell you that he he's a, a writer you know lives in the bay area we both did journalism at the time um he was like when he did a review of the show he was like wow i've never seen the punani poets perform with strippers absolutely true we never performed with strippers. The only time before Real Sex, we didn't, if you came to one of my shows, which there weren't that many, I was only doing shows to promote the book, um, which now is only available. Like it's a collector's item. So you can find it on like um, eBay or something, but it might cost you two or $300 because I took it out of print. Um, I like what this is being said. I don't know, can you see what's, what, what's down here? Uh -uh. It's said that every female rapper um, has been trying to emulate you. Uh, actually, I agree with that. When you look at some of the rappers that are out, thank you, Elliot Jackson, for pointing that out, um, that a lot of the hip-hop artists we're seeing now were inspired by you. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know how I feel you about that. Like that? <laughs> I, I don't know how I feel about it all together because I didn't, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, I didn't mean to, I took the ven I took the opportunity to put Punani Poets on that venue because Jesus is international. It it mm -hmm. launched us into inter international stardom like immediately. Don't get me wrong, I put a lot of work in. I was a journalist. I, I was in hypno, huh? I used to write for these magazines. So I was able to use the media to kind of push the Punani Poets. I don't think people realize that. It wasn't a fluke. I worked hard. You know, right. to, to I, I, I'm, to, I'm admiring the process here. <laughs> I, I worked hard, and um, and like I said, it, it was just a culture that was going on that was. Dead. I'm a feminist more than anything. I'm a, a a black female feminist. Um, a child of foster care, a person who was put in into a position to have to fight back, to fight my way out of circumstances that I was in from the time I was very little. I don't know another way to be. I, I don't know another way to be than to um, recognize uh, people trying to put their foot on my neck and position myself to get out of that situation. So I never, yeah, I wasn't completely embraced by the poetry community, but I don't give a fuck. <laughs> really because 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 i was never really part of it to begin with you know i started out doing my own thing and i i wasn't even a poet i was a journalist and i put a book together punani the hip-hop psalms if you can find it yeah, it's an I anthology like, oh I, yeah I, I got to yeah it's an anthology and and i'm i only have like three pieces in there and there are other people from people i had interviewed at the time like and asked, you know, for a favor. Like I was like, okay, well, I got you in 4080 magazine. Now I'm doing this book called Punani Hip Hop Songs. And I want to know, can you put some poetry in here or maybe give me some rap lyrics? I could lay it out like poetry, whatever. So I got some contributions from like Conscious Daughters, um, Money B of Digital Underground, I'm Dwayne Wiggins. Yes. It, the book is signed by all the artists. Like it's a brilliant wow. book. And it's the book that got me on HBO. I published the book. I self-published the book. And at the time, there was no like digital printing. It was offset. Like I had to use my ex-husband's credit card to get the book. Published. I love your hustle. <laughs> Yo, oh, I'm a hustler. All day, all day. And um, yeah, so I, I sent the book to HBO Real Sex. And the book is what got us on TV. Because it, it you know, that is, um, it was a, a, what you call it? Documentary style mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. So because we had the book they were able to like build something around it and to be honest they were they were like well can you take off your clothes i was like hell no 
<laughs> I was so rude at that meeting. I didn't think they were going to put us on TV because I was like, no, like, I was like, honestly, you know, I was talking to Patty Catholic. I'm like, no one is going to respect me if I'm standing there naked. Like I said, I'll tell you. Just enough. Right. Like I'm already like, t you know, talking about giving head. Like that is a lot for, for poetry, for a mom. I was a young mom, married to a cop, long story. And I refused, but you know, they were pretty persistent. And I was like, I tell you what, our compromise was, <laughs> right? Our compromise was, I will get dancers to dance in the background of the poets. So yeah. that, that, I was just thinking about that the other day. I was like, you know, I didn't, I, I would have parties to kind of, um, if you were lucky enough to come to one of my early parties, man, that shit was dope. We would have, I would do them with Dwayne Wiggins, who today makes my music. I was going to ask you about that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would have these parties that kind of promote what I was doing. I promoted it for a long time, like maybe a year and a half before I even got the book out or anything like that. He ended up doing a soundtrack for the book. Um, so we have music that goes with some of the more popular pieces. And we would do these these parties. And at the party, I would um, have dancers, like wow. in, in the parties. So I already knew dancers, but that wasn't something I was doing in public at the club, like at, at Jeffries and stuff. I wasn't using strippers. We actually didn't use strippers until HBO. And it was a compromise so that this poets didn't have to get undressed. So only one poet showed this. anything. At, you know, um, on the, the set. And that was a um, very talented poet who had also been a dancer before, Tracy Bartlow. Mm -hmm. So she shows some stuff, but I, I still think. that was in that gold outfit looking at herself in the in the mirror. Yeah. Fabulous, fabulous, or something like that. She, she, she said, you um, know, I remember this. <laughs> <laughs> excited by skin that's smooth, elated by my perfect touch. Damn, I'm too much. I mean, she was fierce. I'm not. I am not mad at anybody, you know, who who did the thing with us. And, and definitely they I don't do a lot of anybody who knows me will tell you I don't do a lot of directing. I don't do a lot of um, I call it reality theater because really I'm finding people who are doing what they're doing already. And I find a way to fold it into my show. I find it easier to allow people to be who they are than to try to take control and tell you what to do. You know, especially because my project is fluid. It's a theater project. It's not a group. Let me ask you this, because um, I, I want you to know, I don't know if you can tell by the look of my face. I feel like a little kid, like I could just sit here with a notebook just writing everything down. <laughs> and as a fan, because we're getting to the point where we're towards the end of the show. Could you please tell us some of your next projects? Because the, you can get a little hint with the coffee in the background because you and your manager wife have some really exciting things going on. And I would like you to please, before we wrap, tell us about those. I'd love to you know, talk about it on another show, but I wanna know what's going on right now um, because- Yeah, so just in a nutshell, I, I just wanna say this. I'm gonna touch on this and we can talk about it a little bit. Speak on it. Later. Um, the COVID time, the, the C period or whatever, <laughs> the pandemic. Yeah. Um, put me in a different position. It really got me thinking like, ooh, I wonder if HIV was as bad as I thought it was at the time when I created the Punani Poets. Or was this part of an agenda for, I don't know, like population control or, or sex control? I know for me, it definitely, I got on the straight and narrow sexually. Um, during that time, like I really, <laughs> I slowed down a lot on the personal level because I mean, they had me scared of the black dick. Right. What is going on? And so I got on this whole agenda and all of that. And I'm just like, and then when, when the pandemic happened, I really got to thinking, was I part of a conspiracy to stop black men and black women from having sex without condoms? That it really made me, and I still haven't sorted through all of this. I'm working on a new book where I, I'm explaining 
it in a little bit more deep and a lot more detail about why, you know, I pulled back a little bit for the last um, few years. Mostly my show is about love and romance. I do romantic comedy shows mostly. So there's not really like a lot of AIDS awareness and stuff like I did in the very beginning. It's um, a little less sexual in some ways and a little more sexual in some ways because it's interactive. So we have like love confessions, kissing competitions. (laughs) (laughs) There's a blindfold thing now where um, it's a lover's ID game where I'm blindfolded. Can you identify your lover by smell? By, oh, oh, yeah, by smell or by um, touching their hand. Like, is that your lover's hand? And and it's so cute. It's so cute. And um, so we just keep it a lot of fun, keep the energy going. Because mostly what I discovered working with the Punani Poets is that what was lacking was our ability to really have public displays of affection. So mm-hmm. that when, when hip hop came out with all this bold sexuality, we all jumped to it because we never got to see it. Right. There That's wasn't movies fair. that show black sexuality really beyond porn. That was our, you know, a little narrow scope of, of black sexuality. Just you saw it in porn and it wasn't long before they start pushing the booty agenda through porn. Anal sex. Um, yeah. That's another. Discussion. Right. It's a whole di- it, it's not really a whole different discussion because it's all connected. It's all definitely connected. So today, if you see a show, I'm talking a little less about. Uh, sexual health and a little more about mental health and um, relationship within a relationship. I remember when you were doing more of the, the sexual health. I mean, because I've been keeping up with yeah. you online. So the mental health thing is new to me. I didn't know you were moving in that direction. Okay, Not well. mental health in terms of like um, taking meds. You know, I'm anti-meds. I'm anti all that crazy oh. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but what I mean is is looking at your sexuality in a healthy way expressing your sexuality in a healthy way and i try to stay away from conversations that involve things like um devices ah devices right because i don't know because that pandemic stuff scared me into wondering is any of it real all i know that's real for sure is love Yes, ma'am. And I operate from a place of love. I promote love. Um, nobody can accuse me of anything else. Like at the end of the day, this is about our people, giving our people a chance to express themselves. What I've discovered is people are, are more likely to be honest in a room full of people than they are just sitting in bed with their lover. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So we have love moment on that. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's amazing. You know that if you go to church. Yes, ma'am. I'm anybody who goes to church understands like something about the power of, of being able to speak before witnesses makes it so much more real and so much more intense. Um, which leads to coffee. Um, when I would do these events with Dwayne, we would call them the coffee shop. Our, our events. So all okay, this is, yeah, is okay. all old hat to me. Matter of fact, my first publishing company was called Coffee, C-O-F-F-Y. So now you you we have a social media site called Coffee Talk, coffeetalk.com. If you want to get oh, in touch with me, that's where you can find me, coffeetalk.com, because again, the, all the algorithms and the pandemic and all that made it hard for me to reach people because they control everything and this one is on the mighty networks platform which is not my platform but i feel very comfortable there right now until we can build our own and then um we have besides that thank you yeah then we have coffee talk radio that's where my podcast is well our community podcast so there are other team members who are making their own podcasts and things like that and i just was you know, I'm just a little nervous about how little control we really have. If they were to shut down Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, we would literally be in the dark. So I wanted to create a platform where I could still reach people and people could still reach me in spite of whatever they may do to control our ability to communicate with one another. Right now, 
online they're talking about um coming after people who speak against the government people who promote any type of conspiracy and all that type of stuff like TikTok you, and the Chinese yep don't yes yeah. it's definitely um time that we get our own we get our own been time black planet time. had the idea years ago and then we got away from that one okay that's a whole mm -hmm. nother conversation but let me just say this coffeetalk.com right coffeetalk.com from there you can get to everything else that's right Okay. our coffee tv and all that we have a coffee shop opening so you can actually come and get some real coffee down here in georgia and above all you can come to the land that Dwayne actually bought here in georgia which is where all types of magic is going to happen from um retreats with music retreats health and wellness retreats with my friend ami who's our resident yogi um, she teaches yogi and qigong. We're doing our Voices of Foster Care program with her as my partner. We both grew up in foster care. And again, I'm all about speech, like free speech and telling your story and pushing up against um, the world with your facts, your truth. You know, people who would, who would like to um, suppress and control your voice, keep you in a box, keep you fearful. And Ami even talks about fear, like as part of her program, she talks about fear and how fear affects your health. Um, like how yeah. your emotions are connected to certain organs. Fear is directly connected to your kidney. So people who are dying from kidney failure are, it's fear. the emotion is fear that's wow. affecting your kidney. So bringing that type of science into it, I'm good with that. It's mostly Eastern type of medicine and theory. And um, I, like I said, I don't speak on the health stuff so much anymore, but I will find professionals this who walk in that lane. And so this is where you can come to Electric Church. That is the name of Dwayne's land. We've right. been out there helping him develop it, my nonprofit. I have my uh, interns out there. We, we were doing some um, pulling of carpet and painting of walls and taking down of, of wallpaper and getting them some gainful employment and ah. just like really just building a great um family of of young people old people people all in the middle teachers um it, it's just gonna be fantastic and we've we haven't even really officially opened the doors yet and already you go out there and the magic is amazing it's 13 Point five acres. There's a huge lake in the middle. There's fish. People have been going there. They've been doing fish and release, like catch and release down there. And um, you can walk the land and get in touch, you know, with nature. Do some grounding with your feet on the earth. Like it is really I, amazing. I'm coming. You know, I'm coming. <laughs> you, know I'm, I'm coming. I, you right up the street. August. I, right. I, I'm not that far away. Um, right. Now I was just told my producer that we run out of time. It's all good driving me Ugh. but um <laughs> I, I want to I, can can you hang around after the show because i have an idea to run by you um in the coffee shop it's it's all it's my muse is all in my ear okay two minutes. First, before we go i just want to thank you for the cartoon image of me oh thank you i thought we were going to get a chance to show it but i'm not working the controls <laughs> no i mean from way back when you first oh. did that, it was it was one of the first um, ways that I was personally branded because I, I really I really stay in the background a little bit more than I probably should. And I usually do like kind of like silhouettes and things. But you did this cartoon way before the computers were generating them. And just thank you so yes, much you. for that. And I still use it to this very day. I, and, and I'm honored. I'm, <laughs> can I, just say this? I know we're out of time, but one of my favorite moments was when you came to Charlotte to the Blumenthal and we were just trying to get in our seats and just kind of like, just sliding with the crowd. And you were like, wait a minute, is that Lita? <laughs> and I was yes. like, oh my God. And I felt like that person, like when you're late for church, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And you were like you out. the artist who did my <laughs> caricature, and it, I, I just love that you don't mind sharing the wealth. So the opportunity to have you on here, you just don't know what this means to me. I mean, this is um, 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm having a little fangirl moment, but but it's all good. Thank you. Um, well, thank I'm a fan of yours too. I can't wait to see what happens with your cartoon series. Thank you. Thank yes. You. you might pop in again if that's okay with you. <laughs> it's all thank good. You. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. And I, along with Harry Belafonte, I think you are an activist who does art. I think that's absolutely. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, that. man, I'm from Oakland. <laughs> it's all, all I know is is fight the power, man. Love you, sis. Love you too. Thank you all for tuning in. I said what I said. I said what I said.